voilà, donc euh, on... j'ai donc euh, euh, l'immense joie de recevoir euh, Timothy Davis, euh, qui, euh, à la... sur la suggestion de Frédéric Pouzin, euh, qui est euh, enseignant, chercheur, euh, on peut dire comment rattaché à Paris-Belleville. Hein euh, donc, euh, Tim Davis, c'est, on peut dire, euh, l'historien, euh, l'historien américain des Parkway, le plus, le, 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 le plus important, celui qui a écrit le plus sur le sujet, notamment sur les Parkway de l'âge automobile. Hein. Euh, il a, euh, donc, il vient euh, de faire paraître un ouvrage euh, en 2016, cet été, qui est sorti cet été. Euh, qui s'appelle euh, National Park Roads a Legacy in the American Landscape. Il est lui-même donc historien. Il travaille pour le, l'US National Park Service. Il est l'auteur de plusieurs textes et articles sur, euh, sur cette histoire des parkways. Il a aussi contribué à un ouvrage collectif sur euh, ce théoricien euh, enseignant de paysage américain très connu dont on parle beaucoup dans cette école qui est J.B. Jackson. Et puis, il est également le co-auteur de cet ouvrage que je vous recommande fortement, qui est la Bible du DSA d'architecte urbaniste, euh, que, qui se trouve à la bibliothèque du DSA d'architecte urbaniste, qui se trouve aussi euh, à la bibliothèque générale de l'école, qui est tout un travail de redessin euh, des routes, des parkways américains des années 30, 40, 50. Voilà. Euh, donc Tim va, va, va donner donc une conférence qui va durer à peu près euh, 45 minutes, ce qui laissera du temps ensuite pour, euh, pour les questions. Voilà, je laisse la parole. It's up to you. Well, I want to thank you for inviting me here, and, and I want to thank you for suffering through a lecture in English. Um, if I talk too fast or you miss parts, don't, don't feel too bad. Just enjoy the drive as we go through our national parks, both in terms of history and geography. So if, if nothing else, you'll have a, a vacation this afternoon in, in our parks. The idea behind this was that, that millions of people a year drive our national park roads, but few really think about the roads they drive on. And that's on purpose. Road, park roads are meant not to call attention to themselves. But it's unfortunate. Uh, For one thing, roads really are the way most people experience national parks. People have always thought that was bad, but that's that's the way it's been. So there are these great achievements in engineering and landscape architecture, and they they shape the visit uh, of everyone in a very carefully designed way. And we'll we'll talk about that first. But uh, the bigger question, uh, historical issue, is that they're also where park management, uh, debates about how you design and use a park, often revolve around park roads. The, the challenge is to balance preservation. Parks are meant to preserve natural or cultural resources. Uh, and access, they're made to give people access to present this scenery or nature or history. So throughout the history of, especially in the United States National Parks, there's always been this very conscious question about balancing preservation and access. And people were very conscious, maybe not everyday drivers, but people who were concerned with parks in a serious way understood that park roads You may talk about them in terms of architecture and engineering and landscape architecture, but these discussions are really debates about the nature and meaning of national parks. Uh, As one famous uh, conservationist wrote in the 1950s, park roads determine park history. So first, how many people have been in American national parks? What parks have you been to? Okay. Yosemite, yeah. The East, Coast. the East Coast ones, yeah. Do you recognize that first picture? Yeah. Any other parks? Yellowstone, 
Rocky Mountain. Everybody goes to Yosemite. Yeah. So, there's this tremendous variety from the, the high mountain parks with alpine lakes and glaciers to deserts to, to jungles in, in, in Hawaii. Um, we even have parks through volcanoes, which can be hard for park road managers and for visitors, as you see, volcanoes. Um, and we have our parkways, which go in some places for four or 500 miles through natural and cultural landscapes. And around Washington, D.C., we have shorter parkways that are both for recreation and for commuting. So the, the challenge of combining them. We have historical parks and military parks. Uh, some of these road systems date back to the 19th century uh, and roads through historic preserved towns, or on the bottom there, that was an attempt to present to motorists the history of this region that is now nothing but woods. It was a little silly. Uh, and there are paved, very high technology roads, and there are very simple dirt roads, uh, some extending for miles, uh, some historical roads. The road there was, was a, played an important part in a battle. Uh, that in the middle is, uh, it was a historic road uh, in the 19th century, and that's all that's left of it. And again, some are extremely, some of the most technically sophisticated structures uh, at the time uh, were part, uh, these roads built in the 70s, uh, 80s, and 90s, uh, very advanced technology. Um, and park roads, there are certain designs, they may be different in different places, but there are certain design techniques uh, using winding curvature to follow the contours of the land so that you don't have a big, ugly excavation, uh, which, so it's both better looking and more environmentally stable. And it's also more attractive to look at a winding road, a serpentine curve uh, historically has been considered more attractive. Uh, the use of alignment to display striking features uh, you know, on a curve or at the end of a long straightaway, uh, design techniques like that, things like the use of tunnels, both again to direct the view and to preserve the landscape. Uh, park roads, you wind much more closely to the scenery, to, to nature. The rocks and trees are much closer to the motorway. Um, which can cause problems for engineers. Um, again, some of this, this curvature, the narrow, windy roads can be thrilling, but they can also be scary and, and dangerous. Uh, it's, a, it's a thrilling experience. We like to believe that because it's so obvious you will kill yourself, that you drive more slowly. But um, taking into account the need for safety Throughout the parks, there are all these different sorts of guardrails, guard walls, made with local stone. You see how the colors blend in with the native uh, stone. And that becomes part of the, of the character of National Park Roads. Uh, same thing with the bridges. They're all modern concrete bridges, but the use of native stone masonry to, to, to harmonize them with their landscape. And, and to harmonize with cultural landscapes, the, the brick there is going through a colonial park, so it's a colonial brick. Uh, tinting the pavement itself so that it, it blends in with the landscape there. And again, hiding very modern structures uh, with this rustic stone thing. And, and the associated structures and signage and entryways um, also trying to look of the place uh, both naturally and, and culturally. Um, and there are other unique things about park road, national park, some national park roads, um, which are fun for visitors, but also pose challenges for park managers and, and road designers. Uh, so on one aspect, we're looking in these projects uh, about them as part of the engineering, architecture, landscape architecture heritage of America. But we're also looking at them as, as social history, as part of the social history of America. A lot of people think that roads and parks and cars and parks 
are a conflict, especially over the last 20 years. You see this, this feeling that roads and parks don't, don't really go along. But one of the things I tried to do with this is to really emphasize the long time relationship between roads and parks, between vehicles and parks. The idea that, and this is probably easier for Europeans to understand than Americans because we have our whole wilderness um, romance, that parks are for people, that, that parks are, are, are nature being controlled for the use of people. But in the United States, where this wilderness mythology reigns, it, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a point that's very hard to make. So in this book and some of the other work, we, we talk about the origins of park roads, and, and I think you've probably heard some of this, about how they go back to you know, as early as the first hunting parks, the most desirable way to move through it was on a horse fast. Uh, subjects couldn't do that, but nobles could. In the uh, 18th century, early 19th century, English and other landscape parks were designed to be viewed in motion uh, by carriages. And again, in, in the United States, over the last 50 years, it, a lot of people make fun, look down on tourists uh, who drive through parks. But as early as 1800, Repton was pointing out that most people who go through parks, they're not sophisticated philosophers. They're out, you know, having fun. Um, maybe they're courting, maybe they're showing off their new petticoats, um, playing with their new carriage. And he writes about the need to design very carefully, explicitly for people who aren't paying attention um, with things like this, framing a view uh, with trees here, just like we saw with the tunnels. Uh, these ideas are translated to the United States in the 1860s and 70s by Frederick Law Olmsted and Calvert Box. And yeah, in America, history of these sorts of things, you hear a lot about the philosophical importance of, of nature. And you hear very little about the roads and the people. You see pictures like the one on the top. So it was important to point out that if you look at popular culture of the time, Central Park is all about the roads and the carriages. Uh, even before the park is finished, you see they're in there in their carriages, and Olmsted and the park commissioners were bragging that, at the number of carriages that went through in a day. Um, they were considered the best way to see them was, was through, um, through a carriage, and tens of thousands of carriages, great crowds of carriages, he wrote extensively, I won't get into it here, about some of these de design techniques I just discussed. They were high-tech environments for the day with modern pavements, modern bridges. Um, and Olmsted and Vox also invented the parkway, taking from French precedents the, the avenues in Paris. Yeah, and, um, but then in the 1870s, but then by the 1890s, making it more of an informal, linear, English-style park. Again, designed for carriages, but so you could get from one park to another in your recreational carriage without having to deal with ordinary traffic. Same with the history of tourism. The, the history of tourism, or the history of scenery and the meaning of nature in the United States has been told as you know, poets and artists leading the way to these sort of philosophical experiences of nature. But if you look at what regular people were doing, or upper middle class people at the time, they were celebrating the means of getting to places as much or more than the places themselves. They celebrated the experience of moving along a canal or moving up the river in a steamboat. Uh, because America was not just supposedly the greatest natural, had the greatest nature, but we supposedly had the greatest engineering and technology. So we wanted to celebrate both. But looking back historically, a history that's often told by landscape architects and, and art historians, you, hear, you don't hear that side of the story very often. So we wanted to bring that back. And, and when you got to these places, you ran around in a carriage. Um, and again, you did the same sort of things you did in an urban park. You're flirting and, uh, and then there was adventure, these scary roads. And then they started building even railroads to the top of mountains, and that was also celebrated as achievement, both in terms of nature and technology. So when we get our national parks, uh, Yosemite isn't officially a national park in 1864, but 
essentially functions as the first national park. There's nothing there, and people want access. At the beginning, there was, it was all preservation and no access, and people pushed for access because uh, it was, took a long time to get there. It was hard. It was scary. People wrote about these frightening trails. Uh, you see the dead horse there and falling off the cliff. Uh, people wrote about how it was exciting and thrilling, but also exhausting. Olmsted also wrote the first report for Yosemite, and he writes about the importance of preservation, which, again, historians talk about. But he also says the most important thing, the first priority is access, because people were so tired, he says, especially women would be tired out and exhausted, um, that they didn't enjoy the park. They didn't get the spiritual, the recreational, the, the value of the park, uh, because they were too tired. So there's a, in the 18... 70s, the government doesn't have the money or the interest in building roads, so private companies from towns outside the park race to have roads into the park. And by 1874, there are three roads into the park, and they're celebrated uh, with bands and parades and fireworks and speeches. Uh, and then they want faster and faster and faster roads, the advertising how you can get through in record time, um, and people wrote about, already by the 1870s, people were complaining about people going through the park too fast. And because people get bored with scenery, they invented all these things to do with, you know, funny things to do with trees. And, and, and again, celebrating the stagecoach and the roads, uh, even more so with Yellowstone. When it's created in 1872, a lot of the popular imagery it has the geysers and the bears and the stagecoaches. Uh, and, and the roads are part of the popular mo romance of, of Yellowstone because it was the same thing, hard to get to, your horse falls, your, your, uh, the parks were for the people, but the people couldn't enjoy them. So in the 1880s, our US Army engineers come in and over the next 20 years build a classic loop, just like they would in a gentleman's estate or Central Park, around the park. And one of the most interesting features was this uh, a viaduct that was very scary. Um, and it had this, uh, the construction crew found this big rock, and the engineer says, that's dangerous, get it out of there. He wants to throw it away. But other people say, no, save it, it will be a picturesque feature. So they go to great lengths to make this, move it out and make it look natural again, and it becomes a favorite feature of the park. Ten years later, more and more people are coming through the park. They need a bigger, stronger road, a bigger, stronger viaduct. And the same thing, the engineer says, you know, get rid of it, kick it into the canyon. And the photographer and the tourist people say, no, 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 save this. This is part of the park. So they go this very elaborate construction, again, to make it look natural. He also built this very big gateway, which emphasized the, the law the, for the benefit and enjoyment of people. And of what was at the time a very high, highly, the most advanced bridge technology in the world for working with concrete to create a very, very long uh, classical looking bridge. And he wrote extensively, again, like Olmsted or Repton, about the aesthetics of park road design. So by 1900, 1905, you could go from all around Yosem Yellowstone in a stagecoach, stay at these very fancy hotels. It cost a lot of money, and it was pr mostly rich people who did it because of the time and the fancy hotels. Um, but you see the tourist souvenirs celebrating uh, the arches, the bridges, uh, the new roads. Uh, the people really celebrated the road features. This is. Uh, Mount Rainier, the next big park, a similar idea with a similar aesthetics, and again with engineering triumphs too. Then in 1900, the automobile comes along. Somebody sneaks into Yo Yosemite with this car, drives it out onto the famous point, gets into papers, and it's both celebrated and, and <laughs> people complain about it. But the biggest complaints, and the same thing happened in other parks, were not really that they didn't belong, but that the roads weren't safe enough. Uh, so automobiles were outlawed. Then in 1908, 
Mount Rainier is the first park to allow, legally allow automobiles, but women couldn't drive the last steepest part of the road because the superintendent said it was, everybody knew that women get dizzy and can't control themselves when they come to a, a cliff, so women are not allowed to, and that, that was in place actually until 1917. Women, women earned the right to vote in America before they were allowed to drive. Um, but the problem was that these roads were made for stagecoaches, built by hand. The bridges and the roads were not ready to accommodate automobiles. Uh, finally, though, there's a lot of protesting. And by 1915, uh, 1913, in, in the Lenity Yosemite, with all sorts of rules to try to make it safe. Uh, and then the, our National Park Service isn't created until 1916, but there's a, a feeling that all these individual parks should be governed, managed together, both for better management and for better publicity, better politics, better money. Um, and, and the feeling is that the, that the automobile will make the parks more democratic. Uh, it won't just be rich people with month who can stay in these elaborate hotels, take long vacations. So it will make the parks, more Americans will enjoy them, and then more Americans will support them when they're threatened by negative uses, and they will support uh, adding more parks. So they work with all kinds of businesses and auto clubs to, to embrace and promote automobiles in the parks. Um, at the same time, both of those two, the two people before were the first two directors of the National Park Service. They believed the best way to see a park was to go into the backcountry on horseback and, and, and really promoted that too. There would only be one very, one or two roads and the rest of the park would be um, free, free of automobiles. And they did a, a lot of different promotional activities to, to promote get, uh, the roads as both patriotic and economic uh, benefits. Uh, one of the funny things they did was these stickers you could collect from park to park. And as you see, when you went to too many parks, you almost couldn't see the park anymore. So they made them smaller. Uh, and they promoted auto camping, camping um, in the, to make it cheaper, make it more accessible. That brought um, thousands, tens of thousands of more people into every park because it was much cheaper. Uh, and the stagecoaches converted to these, these um, automobile buses, uh, automobile stages, they called them. So by 1920 or so, a lot more people are going into the parks. The uh, people are, the park managers are, and, and park supporters are, are happy. And according to these cartoons, the parks are happy too. But the parks, the infrastructure can't accommodate it. The roads, the campgrounds, the parking lots, is, are just overwhelmed. Uh, you can see the roads built for stagecoaches, uh, not really ready for automobiles. But the problem is there's no money. It's the Park Service is asking for money, and they, they keep having troubles getting money. Uh, finally, in 1924, they get their first big uh, bunch of money, and they start to go to work on the roads, and they actually have this like biblical passages that they quote about, you know, it's almost like God's work, building roads and parks. And again, this cartoonist who, who, who worked for a newspaper near Yosemite, celebrating it. But then the challenge is, how do you build a motor road? They have to be straighter, wider, more substantial, much harder to hide. Uh, but you don't want the construction, you don't want making access to destroy the park in, in the process. Uh, so they look at different uh, models, um, different roads being built around the United States. And as you can see, these roads aren't really very aesthetic. They're ugly. Um, the excavation, sharp turns, big cuts across rock faces. It's, it's not the kind of landscape architecture aesthetic the Park Service wants. Um, they do like the Bronx River Parkway. It's 1922. Uh, in, outside of New York, these were landscape architects working with engineers to develop arguably the first really modern motorway and, and integrating landscape architecture and engineering. And they looked at something called the Columbia River Highway, which is finished in 1916, 
and is seen as the, the best scenic road in America, and it, the first one really does long designed for an automobile. Uh, you can see those same characteristics that you see later on in the parks. And, and actually, they learned about this, the people who designed it, they were in Paris in 1908 for an international road conference, and they went and they looked at the Achsenstrasse, the ones on the bottom are the Achsenstrasse, and the ones on the top, you see what they're doing on this American scenic road. Uh, and then we have our federal highway engineers who are, I don't want to offend any engineers here, um, but they, they want the biggest, best roads that humans can make. And, and they're very scientific and they're proud of their engineering prowess. And the Park Service thinks, doesn't really want to get involved with them. They think they're going to overbuild the roads by applying rigid, unvarying standards. Um, and they have these incidents where they, they show how the, the federal engineers are just cutting down trees where they could have just gone around them. Um, so they develop their own workforce, hire their own landscape architects and engineers, and that was the chief landscape architect, and the guy in the middle is the chief engineer. And as I think you can almost see, he was a very arrogant, felt he knew everything, felt he was the best road person in the world. And he starts to have fights with the landscape architects and the park service philosophy. Um, one was over bridges. Uh, if you're an engineer in the 1920s, concrete is a wonderful thing. Uh, it, it allows you to do new things. Your bridge, if it's concrete, should celebrate its concreteness. You can make a beautiful bridge with concrete. I mean, that's an American one. The most famous were uh, my art in Switzerland. He's not really a modernist. He's not using that kind of thing. But he's proud of engineering, that engineering can be beautiful. He says if you cover it up with rocks, nobody will see it. I mean, and that was the point. But, but he didn't think, you know, he, he thought engineering and nature could go together as they had in 19th century America. And a lot of popular imagery from the 1920s and 30s agreed. Uh, the other thing that he fought with the landscape architects and the park service directors about were roads that were very aggressively climbing up the mountain with all these switchbacks. But conquering nature was part of what Americans did and, and showing that you were conquering nature. And remember, these are little cars and, and even getting over a mountain is a great achievement. And people, he argued, and, and I think people a lot agreed that it was great to climb this thing and then look down and see where you climbed up. And again, but that's opposite of what the Park Service wanted. He did do it in one of the first big roads, General's Highway. But then the biggest road project was something called Going to the Sun Road in Glacier National Park. And Goodwin's idea was to go up like that again through that beautiful valley. Um, and Mather, on the horse there, he doesn't, he's skeptical. So he and Goodwin and that landscape architect go up there. The landscape architect says, it's gonna look like miners have been in there if you let him do that. Let's take the road way over to one side and come back over and you only see the road once and you'll spare that. And Goodwin says, what are you talking about? I'm the best road designer in the world. Um, I'm insulted, you know, you don't know anything about building roads. Um, so Mather gets mad, he, he storms off on his horse, and they go and they do get these federal highway engineers, and they bring in this guy on the left, uh, who actually studied with the Columbia River Highway guy, and you can see the relationship between the Columbia River Highway, the, the Oxenstrasse, and this really first great National Park Road. Uh, and it was a tremendous achievement, uh, even just to build it. And this is just the survey. People, people, um, nobody died during the survey. I think five or six people died during construction. But it was a, a pretty intense construction. So the Park Service and the engineers make an agreement. And almost immediately, these problems arise. The engineers and the contractors um, make a mess. They don't have that landscape sensibility. That's Yosemite uh, and Glacier again. They're just, they're not being very conscious about landscape values. So the Park Service gets mad at them. Um, and they have a big conference. And they finally start working well together. 
So throughout the 1930s is really considered sort of the golden age of Park Road uh, design in America. And you really did get a, a good cooperation between landscape architects and engineers. Again, some of these projects, the going to the Sun Road was finished, you know, 5,000 people at the celebration. Uh, another road uh, in Rocky Mountain National Park. The first road looked like this. It obviously wasn't up to modern motorway standards. And they replace it with a road that is, is more engineeringly better for motor roads, but also is more attractive, displays the scenery better, and, and again, shows those, those qualities we talked about. Uh, getting up this without making an ugly mess, they decided to use a tunnel to hide the road. In Yosemite, the challenge was building a road that was, had a low enough grade for automobiles from this famous scenic view that had been part of the Yosemite experience since the 1860s. You saw what was called Inspiration Point, but you couldn't get a road from there down into the valley without really making a mess much further down. So they, they and some people really wanted to keep that view but, so what they eventually do is they, they use another tunnel, they go much lower, and you get that same view, but now framed in a tunnel. And people argued that it was even better because you have that experience of driving through in an automobile. You know when you're in a tunnel and you see that little bit of light, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you see that incredible view. So that was considered a great example of road design. Uh, Skyline Drive in near Washington, one of the first big Eastern Park roads, but here they discover that this notion of access isn't just about physical access, but social access. In the South in the United States at that point, African Americans were not allowed to use the same facilities as white people. So in order to get Southern politicians to approve these parks, they had to approve that system. Uh, they could drive through the park, but there was only one campground they could use. Uh, and they didn't, the Park Service did not like this, and by 1941 they stopped it, but it was, you know, not a great thing. And then in 1932, well, uh, in the 30s, early 30s, they start building their parkways. First, these historical parkways around Washington and in Virginia. Uh, and then the Blue Ridge Parkway, which goes 480 something miles from the Great Smoky Mountain National Park to that Shenandoah National Park. And, Addition, in addition to showing nature, it was designed to show America's agricultural heritage because that's another thing that we should be celebrating, America's supposedly virtuous um, farmer heritage. Uh, so by the end of the 30s, there are hundreds of new, no, they didn't so much extend the mileage of roads in old parks, but they, they made many, many more new parks, and they built these, these relatively sensitive roads uh, that embodied this harmonious relationship between engineering and landscape architecture. And they were incredible engineering technology achievements, uh, construction. Uh, you can see there that they're covering up the fresh scar of the cut. Of the cut. Um, a lot of this was possible because of the Depression, our, our New Deal, uh, government programs to put people to work putting thousands of young men to work, working on these roads, and, and paying also for the parks and for the higher technology. Um, so the, the federal engineers celebrate this. They use this as examples of good road design. You, know, you have engineers basically giving a lesson in Repton here in their highway engineering book, which is incredible. Um, and they do these great silent films of people in these little cars um, going through the parks. And, and you also can see 1920s, 30s road building technology. It's really, really pretty, and, and, they, and they do that drive through the tunnel. Uh, and tourist bureaus and magazines and the Park Service celebrate it too. Lots of ceremonies to call attention to these roads and their achievements. So by World War II, when things stop, there is the sense that the automobile has made national parks accessible to most Americans. But there's also the sense that there's a good balance that maybe 10 or 15 percent of the park is developed, but developed in this very attractive way with the rustic look, uh, and 90 percent of the park is free of, free of development. So the Park Service believes that's a good balance. But 
even at this time, people are complaining, for one thing, that the new roads are too modern. You move through the park too fast. They like these kind of 1920s teens roads that, where you're in a much more intimate relationship with nature. Um, and they felt that you moved through too fast, and that actually moving fast was dangerous, too. And a new philosophy of American nature comes in, um, called the wilderness movement, believing that nature as parks is too much about development, that the park service shouldn't be developing, building infrastructure, bringing automobiles and roads into the last bits of American wilderness. And they call for wilderness parks, uh, parks devoted not to having uh, this tradition, what we would call a traditional park experience. And they, so the campgrounds and the cars, they see this as a bad thing. And there's, there's a lot of criticism from the elites by the 30s. Although the first thing happened around 1920, not against um, automobiles, but carriages uh, on, on one small park called Acadia. Uh, John D. Rockefeller, who was a rich oil man's son, built an extensive carriage road system, and people complained that the carriage roads were destroying the wilderness. Uh, but the big debates were, it was, it was a problem for the Park Service because they were always stuck between the people who wanted more roads and the people who wanted less roads. And again, early, they were both on the same side, but by the 20s, and especially in the 30s, um, the Park Service is having a hard time. They're being criticized at Mount Rainier because the state of Washington has built all these roads up to the park and the Park Service has hardly built anything in the park. The original plan was to go all around the mountain with a circular road like in Yellowstone or a park, um, urban park. And it, originally everybody agreed, but then the wilderness people said, no, we don't want you to go there, we don't want you to go there. And over the course of the 1930s, the Park Service drops pretty much all of those roads uh, as they decide to, to go f to have more restrictions on access. The same in Shenandoah National Park. There was a big complaint, um, a big fight, because there was one road across the park here, this way, and the automobile people wanted one across the whole park the other way. The Park Service said, tell you what, we'll have no automobile roads here, no automobile roads here, but we'll have an automobile road. They actually survey it along the ridge on the rest of the park. But that becomes a huge fight. Actually, the Wilderness Society, uh, a big conservation organization, is founded to, to fight that. And, and, and eventually, um, the ridgetop roads are not built. In Yosemite, the Park Service works with the Sierra Club, another conservation organization that they were more friends with, and decides not to build roads through some, some roads that had long been planned and actually endorsed by people like John Muir because they would get more people into the wilderness when access was important. They decide that it would be a bad idea to put roads in these wildernessy places or to go out that side of Yosemite. So by 1940, just as people are celebrating the roads, the Park Service is also creating parks like this with virtually no road or no road except maybe a little road in, in the front. Um, then after World War II, uh, more cars, better roads, more prosperity. Um, the parks get inundated with people. Again, the infrastructure can't ho handle it. Um, they have a 10-year, billion-dollar development program to accommodate this growth and to change these crowded roads into um, uncrowded roads again. And it will be a... Uh, a way of, again, with the same kind of design techniques, they say, uh, bringing, making it possible to accommodate even more people. The biggest object, there are a lot of objections. The biggest objection was to modern architecture. And this is the 1950s. So the idea that they're building these kind of buildings in the park, when we're used to these sort of big log cabins, that created a huge, huge outcry. Um, but there were also opposition to the sense that they were building too many and too big roads or that you're approaching these features across gigantic parking lots, and that they look like shopping malls. Uh, the, the most famous fight here was over something called the Tioga Road, this little, narrow, windy road. And they, before the war, 
they did that to the ends of it, which is not really very attractive. Um, and so the Sierra Club and other people try to promote the idea, don't do that, do that. Uh, when they start actually, but, but there's all this congestion. Uh, when they start to f upgrade the middle part, there are a lot of photographs published uh, showing how bad it is. Uh, and then the final fight was over this section of this big granite area, where from a traditional park road perspective, it's beautiful. You come out of the trees, like Repton would have you do, you come over this great sweep of granite and you see this mountain lake and, and you see the whole Sierra. So in terms of landscape design, it's brilliant and beautiful. But from an environmental perspective, you're destroying nature. Plus you're bringing too many people into the park. On the other side, the engineers are saying, no, those roads are too small and too windy. So the park service is stuck between engineers who want that road even bigger and straighter and flatter and the Sierra Club and people, and the Park Service does another compromise, and so both sides are mad at them, but they have, uh, most people were happy with it, uh, except for the engineers and the hardcore environmentalists. But the, the new technology allowed people to do new things, uh, these bridges that harmonize with the landscape in a different way. You know, you don't even touch the landscape, you float above it, and the kind of you know, sprightly modern bridges that, that people like now, if they like mid-century modern. Uh, and it allowed for the, pretty much the completion of some of these 500-mile parkways. Um, so this Mission 66, it's one of these cases of perspective. Is it, was it overdevelopment? I mean, most Americans loved it. You know, you were able to take your all-American family vacation in much, you know, in a much more comfortable and convenient way. But environmentalists and, and preservationists uh, opposed it. Uh, and, and then the worst thing was it really didn't work. I mean, it, it bought a little time, but by the 1960s and 70s, crowding, crowding is continuing. And there's a big change, too. Uh, the head of the park service, there's a sense that these people, this is the 1960s, so people in big cars and trailers going to Yosemite is part of all that young people think is wrong with America. Uh, and this is when we're protesting urban freeways, urban renewal, big organism, Robert Moses. Um, there's a sense that the Park Service is a big, faceless bureaucracy that's pushing, not listening to people, and overbuilding. Um, so they pretty much kick out that park when, when John F. Kennedy becomes president and they bring in a, a new secret minister of the interior, they kick out the longtime more park service people and bring in a new guy whose name's George Herzog and immediately says we're gonna have fewer cars. He has, he's very publicity oriented, you know, uh, jackhammering a parking lot in Yosemite. Here you see, instead of the conventional ribbon cutting ceremony when you open a road, they're, they're, they're closing the eastern end of uh, Yosemite to automobiles, and they have a, a, a ribbon-tying ceremony. Uh, and so you ride on bicycles. Uh, and they revise, they, they issue new park road guidelines, and they actually get Ansel Adams, the photographer, and some other conservationists to be on the committee to design the road guidelines, saying that park roads are much too important to be designed by engineers. And really, this document is mostly just reiterating the traditional park road principles uh, dating back to the 18th century. And they promote all sorts of alternative transportation. Um, by the late 1960s, but in the 70s, even more, first in Yosemite, uh, the, these types of public transportation to, to get people uh, out of their cars. There's a period where they have a lot of maybe over-engineered proposals uh, for these tramways, the, you know, the infrastructure of, of access, supposedly good because it's getting people out of cars, there are a lot of complaints that this would have been too intrusive. So none of these projects get developed, uh, but it was kind of the extreme. Um, and at this point, there are hundreds of transit systems in, in different parks, all, all sorts of different scales. Uh, 
The extreme of this was in Yosemite from the 18, 1980s until about five years ago, they talked about completely getting rid of the automobile and removing most of the roads. Um, and here you see the last iteration of that plan where they're using Photoshop to get rid of these bridges we were just talking about and roads. And this was politically in America not going to happen. You know, we're so wedded to the automobile. Uh, and, it, and it raises other questions about do you have to be young and athletic to go to a park? Uh, and at the same, this is exactly the same time that we're becoming more aware of the historical value, that these are part of our heritage. Uh, it's an important legacy that we should cherish. You start to see people um, putting out information about the history of the parks. Part of this is because it's in a bigger cultural sense, all the baby boomers, all these people who ex experienced the glory days of the American automobile, they're looking at the 1950s landscape nostalgically. And then younger people who never experienced it are even more nostalgic about it because they romanticize it even more. So both popularly and academically, they're, they're, whereas during the 60s, the cars and highways are universally thought of as you know, bad, now there's kind of a movement, a popular, broader movement. Also, a lot of these things are now becoming 50 or 75 years old. There's anniversaries, which helps call attention to things like that, um, actually designating them national historic landmarks. Um, another thing is the roads are in bad shape. It's, it's hard to be a park road. They live a hard life. Um, and so they're, in a lot of places, they're kind of falling apart. And with ever more stringent engineering standards and liability standards, legally being sued for accidents, there's a sense that these traditional park road features are dangerous. The curves, uh, the guard walls are too low, or the guard walls are too rough. That was another argument that engineers talk about guard walls grabbing cars. So that's why all the new guard walls are smooth. So there was a sense that these roads, engineers were calling to upgrade the roads. Uh, and then you get these new vehicles. Uh, lots and lots of gigantic uh, recreational vehicles and more and more big charter buses and more bicycles and more people. So there's, uh, and there were some attempts that definitely went overboard. Uh, at Old Faithful in Yellowstone, they built this gigantic cloverleaf. Uh, they did some other nice things too. They protected this narrow passageway by making it one way for cars and then uh, a bypass. But um, there's a sense that there needs to be more of an understanding about what's historic about park roads and more effort to keep the engineers uh, from over improving them. Again, Yellowstone did some nice things, taking apart historic culverts, numbering them, putting them back together, doing some traditional stone masonry, but that's expensive. So in a lot of places, Yellowstone and other parks do this simulated concrete, form stone, whatever you want to call it, which you can see it doesn't really, I mean, that's pretty mechanistic. And when it gets hit by a rock, it looks even more fake. The worst thing, though, was they widened the roads. I mean, they only widened them, we only widened them four feet on either side, they said. But that's a tremendous difference when you have that little road. Your landscape experience is completely different, especially, you know, so you're, especially in terms of the speeds that you drive through, it, it encourages much higher speeds, uh, especially in the straighter sections. I mean, you can go very fast on these roads. And if you run into, what we call charismatic megafauna, uh, large, large animals, or the people who, who love them. You know, it's, it's, it's actually the argument we have is that it's more dangerous. In Glacier National Park, where going to the Sun Road was, similar problems. The road, because it's on the side of a cliff, was really falling apart. There's a bunch of really kind of unsightly um, quick fixes. And there's a long period of negotiation with the engineers because they wanted to do the same thing. But eventually they, they developed new guard wall types that looked historic but were much stronger. They fixed a lot of the old ones. And then they limited the size of vehicles, which makes it much easier to have a narrow, twisty road um, and, and lower guard walls. And, and so when they're done, it's a lot, little bit wider, but, but barely. Um, and then again, this is also at the time 
we do, we start working on the big green book, as we call it, um, which was a great project. There'd be a group of five architects and landscape architects out in a park like Yellowstone, spending the summer. There usually was at least one international student through the ICOMOS program. And you'd have making the drawings, making photographs. The, the photographer was a full-time professional and an historian. And during the course of the summer, you'd have to figure out how do you represent uh, a road in 12 or 15 drawings. And it, 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 um, after doing a number of national parks, we actually went out and did a bunch of other famous roads in America. But um, uh, I don't want, I'm trying to really get into too much detail here, but the, the drawings evolved from being just about engineering to more and more about landscape and, and the human experience of landscape, and, and then also talking about design uh, and construction principles. Um, one reason for that documentation is, is just literal documentation. When a bridge has to be taken down, you have a record of it. But we also used it to promote the cause of road preservation. We had media events, got articles in the papers, um, got politicians to speak at the events, ways to raise consciousness, and, and also ways of, of getting that information out through brochures, uh, interpretive signs out in the landscape, and, and websites. Uh, and we did a big exhibition in uh, Washington, D.C. that got tens of thousands of people uh, to, to, to learn about historic roads uh, with a lot of the artifacts and, and stories I've been telling you here. Has anybody ever used one of those uh, draw, drafting tables with the big, the letter set? Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and that did get a bunch of publicity, um, both on the web and um, in, in uh, national newspapers. We, d we did the book. Um, all of the, d the documentation is available at the Library of Congress. Uh, you can get on the web and put in Yellowstone Road or Mount Rainier Road or Blue Ridge Parkway and pull up the drawings, hundreds of photographs, and, and the history. Um, and then we did, I did another um, thing that was really m less about just pure history but about treatment, about trying to get engineers and landscape architects and preservationists to work together. Maybe it's different in France, but it's not always easy to get engineers to work with landscape architects and preservationists. So a whole booklet on, on how to work together and how to work with the, the US uh, preservation and road design uh, policies. Uh, and then this, this latest book is the same thing, trying to call attention to national park roads, both as American cultural history and as part of a larger continuum of engineering and landscape architecture uh, you know, and world history. And, but the story keeps going. We're, we're dealing with things like climate change now, uh, severe weather events, wiping out roadways, uh, rising sea levels, destroying roads and coastal parks, um, more ecological concerns. Here they actually took an historic road out of this river valley and moved it up out of the river valley, which the environmentalists liked because it's a riparian zone, uh, there shouldn't be roads in there, and the engineers liked it because the road was dangerous and hard to maintain. But as an historic preservation, I fought it because my sense, you know, this was a great historic example of road design. The, that guy, that Yellowstone engineer had brought it down out of the boring woods and put it in a picturesque canyon. So it's an interesting, you know, different motivations, engineering, environmentalism, ecology, uh, efficient management, and historic preservation. Uh, we're also trying, just like at the beginning of the 20th century, they tried to expand the audience for national parks from rich white people to middle class white people. Now we're trying very hard as America is changing to appeal to, to a younger and broader audiences. Then there's the whole question of digital access. Um, what does it mean when you can access these roads digitally? I mean, you can go on Google, uh, Google Street View and, and go to any park. And you can, you know, here you are having that experience. Uh, but it's, it's really kind of fun. You can go and, 
and, and see these places, and it's a lot cheaper. Um, which brings up another issue, is it's also more environmentally sensitive, right? There's no carbon, it's, it's better for the planet and better for the park if you guys all stay here and visit Yellowstone or Yosemite digitally. Um, you can time, there's a geyser cam for Old Faithful. You know, you can put your espresso on when it's ready, watch Old Faithful do its thing, and it takes five minutes out of your life. There's minimal impact on the ozone layer, um, on the roads. Uh, it's an interesting question about sort of redefining what access means today. Um, and then when we get into drones, you know, how it, will that affect things? I don't know. I mean, right now they're totally illegal. But what would it mean if you could stay, you know, from France, if you could, if there was like a whole garage full of drones, a hangar, a drone hangar, and you could sit here and go through Yellowstone? Um, that's not going to happen, I don't think, because there is this commitment um, to um, getting people into parks. This, we didn't have an internet connection to work, make this work, but I just wanted to let you know that, you know, this, this is already ancient history. Uh, the hand drawing, they do much more things, sophisticated things that you guys are probably doing with laser scanners and point clouds, millions. So we had a, a little fly-through demonstration I was going to show you, but um, you know that's we're not still doing that. Uh, but again, on the whole drone thing, um, the notion that we do want people out there in the parks and and reminding people that this experience of national parks is a human experience. It's about access, that, that parks without people are really not what they're about. It's, but it's, it's also about trying to find a balance between preservation and access, and, and now between environmental values, engineering values, historical values, aesthetic values. This, this is continually being renegotiated. So that's, that's the show for now. If you have questions, uh, sorry we didn't have the fun thing at the end. Alors, j'ai promis aux anciens de projet de vous libérer à 14h, mais on peut quand même prendre le temps de quelques questions. Qui aurait des questions Pas de questions Est-ce qu'il y a un mouvement écologique en, aux États-Unis euh, comme en Europe, qui soit capable de modifier le choix de l'ingénierie. Since the 1960s, it really has. It's, it's had um, a lot more impact. And, and you get things like this, this idea of moving the road out of the riparian zone. Um, we've also seen instances where what is obviously ecologically sensible is politically untenable. Um, we know that those beachfront roads are not sustainable, but the local people who use them, the local businesses, will not let us they, they fight every effort to let them go. Um, and again, the, in um, several parks, there's, there, there's a, a really interesting road project uh, along the side of Everglades, where in the 1940s, 50s, they built, Everglades is a gigantic swamp in Florida, and they built a road along the side of it, the old-fashioned way, on a embankment and it completely stopped the movement of water that was necessary for the health of the Everglades. Um, so now we're engaged in a very expensive project to get rid of that berm and put it up on stilts uh, to be more ecologically sensitive. But yeah, since the 60s, National Park Service policy has, has incorporated ecological values a lot more. But as you see with the Yosemite thing, 
when they run up against traditional idea, American ideas about how a park should be used and also how the business community thinks they're going to make money, then politicians, um, you know, park management is often the political Uh, we have one, Jill, Jill Stein. Um, she's not going to get a whole lot of votes, but um, but she actually she more the it, it will be Ralph Nader ran for the Green Party twelve years ago. He got more votes because he was a bigger name, but it's not happening on the political level so much. But I think what you see is that the professionals. You really see this in transportation planning in the United States. Most transportation, young transportation planners don't like cars. Don't, you know. And so it's a, it's a big change. The older people and the politicians are now having to deal with younger professionals who are, you probably same thing here, you know, who are much more ecologically motivated. Um, it can be very controversial, the whole bike thing can be in Washington, it was fought um, it, for various reasons. Also, um, right now in Maryland, there's a governor that's very pro. You're seeing some people still kind of holding the line on the old fashioned roads and asphalt, but their younger people coming up are much more inclined. And the same thing with people in the parks really since the 1970s, they're, the people actually work in the parks are much more likely to be motivated by environmentalism than traditional ideas of scenic appreciation or something like that. Bon, merci. Donc, le livre sera à la bibliothèque dans quelques semaines. Et quant à nous, on se retrouve vendredi pour le cours à 10h45. Et donc, bravo. Uh, thank you very much, Tim.